Oh, you got one? Come on, come on, come on. Right over here, guys. It's huge. Oh my gosh, look at the size of that thing. Wow. Can I pick it up? You can't. Whoa, look at that. Whoa. All right, here we go. Oh my gosh, is it slimy. If there is one ecosystem on the planet that is constantly changing, it has to be the tide pools. With every single rising and falling of the tide, new waves crash upon the rocks and alter the placement of plants and animals. Along the coast of California, there are a slew of creatures that you can find if you know exactly where to look. A little striped crab right here. Oh, got it. There's definitely no shortage of crabs out here in these tide pools. However, Navigating this terrain can be difficult because most of the rocks are wet and slippery. One of the toughest things so far for me in filming beyond the tide has been the terrain. I'm used to swamps and deserts. Everything here is rocky and slippery. It's all covered in a layer of, I guess it's some sort of algae, and using a lot of eye-foot coordination because I'm looking for creatures and every step I take, your foot might slip off of something and these rocks are extremely jagged. Really easy to get hurt out here. And I'm sure for you, Mark, it's even more difficult. Right now you're balancing on these rocks just trying to get the shots. Yep. Sure everybody at home. <laughs> it isn't easy, is it? Nope. <laughs> All right, well, let's keep going this way and see what we can find. Watch your footing. Oh, yep, see, there you go. I'm usually pretty good at finding animals in the field, but sometimes a wildlife expert joins us to help locate the species that can be very difficult to find. Today I'm back out with tide pool expert Aaron Sanchez, who has been exploring these Southern California pools his entire life. And our goal is to locate a giant sea slug. All right, Aaron, so we're here at the tide pools and we're looking for slugs. What should I be keeping my eye out for? Well, Cody, these slugs are gonna be pretty hard to miss. They're actually the largest sea slug on the planet. They come to these rocky shores here to mate and lay their eggs. Okay, now when you say the largest, do you mean like five to six inches in length, or are we talking bigger? We're talking probably almost a little bit less than three feet. A three foot slug? So it's gonna be pretty hard to miss. Yeah. All right, well, let's start searching. The search was on, and I was confident that I could come across one of these giants. I mean, if they're as big as Aaron says they are, spotting one should be simple, right? Hi, well, we've been searching for about 45 minutes now through all these layered rocks. I don't know, Heron said it was gonna be easy. Nothing yet. We continued to search over jagged outcrops, in crevices, through knee-deep pools, and even under rocks. I'd say the odds of finding one of these slugs are slim to none. Tide's really coming in. Yeah, it's coming in big time, and all I've seen is crabs, crabs, crabs. Hermit crabs, striped crabs, purple shore crabs, no giant slugs. With the tide starting to come back in, it was looking like our search for the giant sea slug was coming to an end. But if anyone knows how to find a sea creature, it's definitely Aaron. Searching, searching. No big slugs. Yeah! Oh, you got one? Come on, come on, come on. Right over here, guys. It's huge. Oh my gosh, look at the size of that thing. Wow, dude. Wow. Yes! Well, that was one heck of a search. And there it is. Can I pick it up? You can. It's totally safe. And it's not gonna ink me. It might be a little slimy, but that's it. Whoa, look at that. Whoa. Right, here we go. Oh my gosh, is it slimy. Oh, look at that slug. Oh my gosh, it is heavy. Jeez, this thing must be about almost 10 pounds, I would guess. Is that a big one, Aaron? Oh, it's a pretty good size, yeah. It's one of the bigger ones I've seen. Wow. I'm gonna let it stretch out of my arms, see if we can get it to fully elongate itself. Oh my gosh, it is so slimy. All right, now tell us about this slug, Aaron. Well, Coyote, what he's wrapping around your arm right now is actually his muscular foot. He uses that to get around. I can feel him gripping onto my arm. I mean, I can feel him actually like wrapping around me and I can feel his little tongue under there. He can't bite, right? No, these guys are vegetarians. They mostly eat algae and kelp. And it does have an internal shell, correct? Where um, it has all of its organs? It does have an internal shell. It's kind of soft and made of protein. Okay. And that is actually what these extensions of its foot called parapodia are protecting. 
I can see why there's no way you would miss stumbling upon one of these. I have to admit, I was just over there talking to Mark. I literally said, I'm really doubting our chances of finding <laughs> one of these slugs. All we've seen all day is crabs and smaller little brown sea hares. Which, by the way, we should grab one of those. Isn't there one over here? Let's see them next to each other. Yeah. All right, you got one of those brown sea hares? Okay, so this is, this is cool, showing the comparison of the giant black sea slug next to the much smaller brown sea slug. And they're both called sea hares, because as you can see, those tentacles sticking up in the air, in the front of the head, look like rabbit's ears. I thought the brown sea hare was big. <laughs> yeah, seriously, there is no mistaking the difference between these two species. Wow, that thing is absolutely massive. It weighs about 10 pounds, and fully stretched out, it's about two feet in length. That is crazy, and it is so unbelievably slippery. It's actually really hard to hold on to it, and my hands and arms right now are covered in a slippery mucus. Now, are they toxic in any way? No, they're not. Okay, so I'm in no danger right now. So they don't bite, they're not toxic, they're just slimy and alien looking. So how do these defend themselves against predators? Well, you know, these guys don't have as many predators as the California sea hare, probably due to their size. Okay. So they would generally just kind of stick to where they are, and they're going to be pretty well hidden in these rocks. I can't even imagine what would want to try to eat this. And it's just so amazing how big this slug is. When you said to me, yeah, we're going to go out, we're going to catch a giant slug, I honestly didn't believe you when you said they could grow to be about two feet in length. And until I actually had this animal in my hand, really on my arm, I didn't believe it. This is absolutely amazing. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for having us out today to explore the tide pools here in San Pedro. I think there's no question about it. This is one big black slug. We gently placed these two slimy slugs back into their respective pools and watched as they slowly returned to the wild. I think it's fair to say that these creatures are as primordial as it gets. And while they may be incredibly bizarre looking, they are an important part of the tide pool ecosystem. In most areas around the world, when the ocean tides recede, they reveal a hidden coastline that is made up of shallow intertidal pools, many of which are filled with colorful plants and bizarre looking marine creatures. However, when the tide pulls back from the inlets and estuaries around Harpswell, Maine, you are often left with an endless expanse of mudflats. These exposed layers are formed when mud is deposited by the tide, and while they may look like a barren wasteland, they usually support a large population of wildlife. Today, the Brave Wilderness team will be joined in the field by Anthony, who is a professional licensed bloodworm digger. For nearly 40 years, he has been raking the mud flats of Maine, and on a good day, he can haul in around a thousand worms. All right, guys, so we have multiple cameras going today, and as you can see, it is still raining. Not too bad right now, but it's gonna be a slightly gritty episode, which is perfect, because today, we are looking for blood worms. It's gonna be muddy, it's gonna be grimy, and if we're lucky, we're gonna find some of these worms that are then probably gonna end up biting me. Isn't that right? That's right. Okay, well, we're gonna leave the big cameras behind, and what we have here, check this out. This Whoa. is a blood worm digging rake. And as I understand it, you kind of slam that into the yep. dirt and mud, yep. pull it back. Well, yep, pull it back, flip it over. Just They say it's all in the wrist. All in the wrist, yes. okay. Now you're coming, right? You're not just gonna stand underneath the edge of the car? Uh, I mean, I could stay back here. No, 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 no. I can see that you've got your, yeah. your water shoes on. We're all uh, getting muddy today. We're all getting in it. All right, guys ready? Let's do it. All right, let's go. Yep. Digging in mud flats is truly a dirty job. And believe it or not, blood worming is a huge part of Maine's fishing economy as these marine worms are sold as bait. So whether you are catching the prized blood worm or the slightly bigger sand worm, a heavy haul can equate to a pretty nice paycheck. However, the good news for any and all worms we catch today is that they will be released back into the wild. Now it's just a matter of getting into the mud so we can start digging. Well, you just let us know what you think the best spot is to start digging. Uh, see, no one knows. No one knows. No one knows. This is tough. It's like you're walking on another planet. It's crazy looking out here. It's all 
kind of glassy looking. And this is every day for you, huh? Every day, Rob. Every day. Yep. How you doing, Mario? I don't know. It's a little intimidating. I feel like I'm gonna just like sink in. This is cool. I've never walked through anything like this before. Oh, I fell. Uh, oh my gosh. I thought you're used to this stuff being from the Everglades. Uh, we don't have this in the Everglades. You want to wash your hand back? Yeah, just wash your hand in that water. Maybe. Just wash it around. There you go. There you go. There you go. A little better? All right, that's a little better. Yeah, I have to keep. Yeah, you need dry hand? No, no, right, I'm serious. Right. I'm serious. No, I'm serious, but I go through this all the time. You guys, you guys. Okay, so guys, check this out. Hey, Anthony, I see there's like a bit of a waterway going through here. Yeah. Yeah. What sort of area are we looking for to start digging? What? I mean, look at oh, look at this. It's smooth mud. Is that worm? Are these worm, worm trails? No, that that looks like um. Oh, this. Yeah. It's uh, a. That snail. That's snail. a snail. Yeah. That's a snail. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so not worm trails. Well, I think this little area here looks like a good place to maybe start. Sure. Why don't you sure. show me exactly what the method is for digging? Ready? Yeah. Oh wow, it just peeled back like that. Oh, there's a little worm. No, there's that stick. No. Oh, it's heavy. See how this goes? Wow, it just but peels back. It's, it's, it's like cake. It like oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. I thought I saw one. Oh, what's that? Is that a tapeworm? Or is that's that a tapeworm. That's a tapeworm. Yeah, but they go. That's oh not what, my goodness. That's not what we're looking for. That's a tapeworm. That's a tapeworm. Don't get that in your stomach. All right, we're going to toss him back there in mud. So Gross. Oh, he stuck to me. Nope. This is like throwing five pound weights. Every lump of mud is about five pounds. That's five pounds right there. And Anthony is just throwing globs of mud effortlessly. Let me tell you who you don't want to get in an arm wrestling competition with. <laughs> Anthony, he's got Popeye forearms. It's crazy. It's tough because you step and you sink. You try to move fast enough so that your feet don't sink. See like that? You ready? Winded, man. That is tough. That is a lot tougher than you guys could possibly imagine. The mud is extremely heavy. And as it pulls your legs down into it, you're trying to balance with your feet. My toes actually hurt from trying to keep myself webbed on top of the mud surface as you sink down. And there's nowhere to rest. It's not like I could just lay down in this mud. Well, I could, but then the environment would swallow me alive. Whew, I'm sweating bullets right now. <sighs> okay, let's follow Anthony. We can't keep up with him. Come on, try right here. Oh, oh what's up? Oh, something big. Get it. It's not a blood worm. Is that a sandworm? Whoa, look at that. That's a beaster right there. But I don't know if it's a bloodworm. I don't see its head coming out. Ooh, I'm putting it in the bucket either way. You got a big one! We're on him. We found the sweet spot. It's the honey hole. Let me see. Oh, yeah, look at that. That's what I've been doing yeah. every day. Yeah. What do you got? Let me see. Yeah, that's Whoa. Big. That's crazy. That's, that's what I dig every day, worms like that. Woo! Yeah. Look at its that proboscis is. coming out. Whoa! <laughs> Big yeah! Alien, oh isn't it? God. You can see Anthony's excited. Yeah. That means this is a good worm right here. Yeah. Wow, look at that. Woo! Got full All fang. Right. All right, we are getting closer to the honey hole. Yeah. I'm gonna put this beast yeah. in the bucket. Show Anthony what we found. Oh, okay. that's a sandworm. That's a sandworm? That's a sandworm. They bite too. Wow, okay. Yeah. Well, at least we found a big one. Woo! Hey, so mighty old. Blood worming on the coast of Maine. Blood! Oh, there's a good one! You got one? You got one? Yes! Oh, that's a good oh one. Oh, oh, it's a big one! Oh, man. Yes! yes. Oh, got one! Yeah. Got one! See, my blood worming song brought him up in the mud. Woo! A little <laughs> muddy, but it finally paid off. I have slung probably 150 globs of mud, and I finally, whoa, don't drop me finally found my first keepable blood worm. All right, let me put it into the bucket. Nice. Ready? 
We got okay. it. All right. We got blood worms. We have a sandworm. At this point, I say we head back to a controlled situation and get these worms up close for the cameras. Woo! This was awesome. Oh man, I'm stuck in the mud. Nice. Mm. All right, guys. So we're back at base camp, and what I have here are two buckets. One that is filled with worms and another that just has some salt water. What I'm gonna have to do is dig through all this gloppy mud that's filled with blood worms, rinse them off, and then place them into this clear container so that we can actually see them. You see, look in there. Oh, there's the big, oh, there's one of our big worms there. Okay. Is this salt water right here? Yes, this is salt water. This is a marine species of worm, which means that they live in salt water. If I were to actually put these worms in fresh water, it would kill them. So we do need to be rather gentle with them. Oh, there's a big one right there. Oh, that is, oh, that's one of the big, look at this. That's one of the big ones right there. Oh yeah. Oh boy. Yeah, that could give you a good bite. All right, get in there, buddy. Okay, I'm gonna move this bucket off of here. I'll get rid of the water bucket. And now we're gonna get up close with these worms. Now we do have a pretty decent size ragworm here. Anthony also called these sandworms. You see that? I think it's crazy looking. Right, look at the iridescence to its skin. And you can see, if you zoom in there, all these little legs on the side, those are called parapodia. And that actually helps these marine worms not only swim, but also burrow. And this also will get extremely long. But that's about its most shrunken up state right there. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and put this one back into the mud bucket. Crazy. Ooh, what do we have next? Man, the moment we've been waiting for, the blood worm, which is exactly what we are going out after today. I wasn't even aware that we would find other marine worm species. And we got a whole container full of them. Um, now, I'm gonna just dump the whole thing into my hand. Okay. You ready? Mm -hmm. Just so we can see what that looks like. Blood. Oh, are they really look a lot like earthworms. Do they smell or anything? They smell like mud. They absolutely smell like mud. And like most worms, they'll just kind of stay completely limp in your hand like that. And oh, I can feel them moving. They don't seem to move as fast as an earthworm. No. All right, I'm gonna just kind of single out the biggest ones. And you may be wondering to yourselves, oh, it's putting out, that one's putting out its mouth. Oh, that is a rather big one. Okay, there are one, two, three, four, five really good sized blood worms, but I think the biggest are these two right here in the middle. So we're gonna pare this down. I'm trying to let them get comfortable and expand out. I also wanna see if there's one that's going to perform for us with what we're all waiting to see, which is that weird alien looking head that they shoot out of the think, front of their face. I think face. that one. That one you just This touched. one right that there. That seems to be the most lively. Yeah, that one also seems to be the, the largest in diameter. All right, we're gonna put these back. Now, one thing that I must note up front, I'm not going to intentionally try to be bitten by this worm, but this is one of the only venomous worm species oh, in the oh, world. There, the right there, you see that? You see the head come out? They have a proboscis that they shoot out of the front of their head, which has four fangs. Those fangs are made of copper, and they're like this, right? It's like a grappling hook. Hold up, hold up. Like metal? Like metal, like the element copper. And those- So it has metal teeth. It has metal teeth. Like a Bond villain. Like a Bond villain. You got it, yes. This is like one of the most bizarre creatures. I didn't even know these things existed until we got here to Maine and somebody said, you wanna go looking for blood worms? And sure enough, this is that creature. Now this worm is a predator. And when they're out hunting, they'll kind of slink through the mud and they're searching for crustaceans or small invertebrates. And they shoot this grappling hook type head out of their proboscis. Four fangs dig in and then with those fangs, they inject venom. That venom paralyzes and sometimes even stops the heart of its victim. And then they sit there 
and slurp up the innards like a slushy. Now, okay, this is really cool. You see how it's completely slinked out like this? Notice that coloration. You see how purple it is? Yeah. It's all peach colored here and purple here. That's why they're called blood worms because their insides are actually dark red and the skin is semi-translucent and you can see that coloration right through there. Wow, that's cool. You can see like little bubbles running through the body. Yeah, isn't that wild? Look down the side of its body there. You see how it looks like those spikes coming off? Looks like hairs. Yeah, those are heropodia. They're like little feet that help this creature to burrow and also to keep its balance if it's in deep water. All right, we got to get that proboscis to come out. Let me see here. I'm going to kind of just lay the worm out in my hand here like this. And you can see, look, it's kind of curling around, probably protecting itself. Can you see that little nodule up front there? What is that? That's a sensory organ. It's a little tentacle, and that's how this creature explores its environment. It can sense chemicals in the water with that little front appendage. Look at up here, you see all that purplish coloration? Oh yeah. And it has a lateral line that runs down the length of his body. You see that real distinct purple line? That's how you can easily identify this as a blood worm. Ah! Oh! Oh, it went for my thumb, did you see that? Totally got that. It did not bite me, but boy, did it make me jump. Wow, it shoots it out really fast. Wow, oh, there it is! Whoa. What? Oh, isn't that crazy looking? That so gnarly. I think this one's fangs are just too small, like it's coming all the way out. I see them, I mean, the fangs are pretty tiny, so I don't think I'm gonna get bitten by this thing. Ugh. What's it doing? It's puking all over me. Mm. Ah, gross. Oh, it stinks. Does it? Yeah. Oh yeah, it does. Oh man, gross. Ah, oh, <laughs> disgusting. Oh my gosh, did you film all that? I got all of it. Let me see. Ugh. Everything poops on you. Oh my gosh, even blood worms poop on me. Oh, look how long its body is when it's slinked out like that. And just like an earthworm, if this marine creature is cut in any area above pretty much this line right here, it can regrow parts of its body. Look at that, you can actually see the colors going through its body. Woo! Did you try to bite me there? I think I was thinking about it. Show me your proboscis. Ow! Oh. Yay! Did it bite you? He got me! <laughs> I got that! He got me, I oh. felt it, it was oh, a little dude. pinch. Let me see. Where did he get you? Right there, right in the crux of my finger. It was like a little pinprick. Ah! <laughs> Does it hurt? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. It kind of itches, actually. <laughs> yeah, did you see that? You think yeah. you got that? Oh, I know I got it. Oh, man. You just kind of whooped around and nailed me. <laughs> well, okay, I was successfully bitten by the blood worm. Definitely not as bad as a bee sting. Although, you know, if it was significantly bigger, it may have hurt more, but ah, it kind of itches a little bit. Like a little mosquito bite? Yeah, kind of like it, it startled me more than anything, but I could definitely feel it. <laughs> My heart's racing. Yeah, <laughs> I even saw you guys jump back. You're not touching the. Uh, no, no, no. I mean, it really didn't hurt, but it was it was a prick. It definitely shot me backward. That was funny. Hey, coyote. Yeah. You're right. I'm all right, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was definitely one very wet very muddy afternoon, but we finally came across a whole bunch of blood worms. Ready to put them back out in the ocean? Let's do it. Sure you don't want to get bitten? Uh, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> At the start of this episode, I honestly had no idea what to expect when it came to digging in the mud for worms. But here's what I learned. First, it's incredibly difficult, not only to walk across the mud flats, but also to dig in the heavy, wet mud. Second, it's muddy, in case that wasn't completely obvious. And third, it's actually a lot of fun, like looking for a needle in a haystack, or in this case, a bloodworm in a mud flat. There we go. That's a pretty good size one right there. Nice. I'd say about as big as we found today. All right, guys, time to let the bloodworms and the sandworm back off into the ocean. 
Now you can release these creatures absolutely anywhere. They live up and down the coast. So this isn't exactly where I found them, but it doesn't matter because they're constantly on the move. They are nomadic, always searching for something new to eat. Maine's bloodworm industry continues to flourish and it's responsible conservation conscious diggers like Anthony who are helping to keep the population of these bizarre looking animals growing. By only taking market sized worms and returning the females and juveniles to the flats, his harvesting methods will ensure a bountiful population for generations to come. There's a famous song that goes, country roads take me home to the place I belong, West Virginia. And on this adventure, we will be following an old gravel country road that will hopefully take us to the place that one very rare creature calls home. This is West Virginia. First time I have ever filmed in this state. Many creatures we can come across. Now it's just a matter of taking this gravel path further into the wilderness and then we'll break trail into the underbrush and see what we can find. Are you guys ready? Let's do it. All right, let's go. Today we are working alongside field herpetologist Tim Brust, who has spent many summers researching the various creatures that call this wild and wonderful state home. And while he specializes in reptiles and amphibians, today we are after one incredibly elusive crustacean that for now, we will simply call the blue crayfish. This is cool. We have a little stream system that is moving right through the middle of the forest. This is actually a great place to look for small woodland frogs and salamanders. Look at this. Most of the time you imagine crayfish living in streams and rivers. However, the species we are searching for today is a variety of burrowing crayfish that lives underground. They can be found in areas known as seeps, which are defined as a wet place where groundwater reaches the Earth's surface from an underground aquifer. Similar to the fully aquatic crayfish species, the burrowing crayfish also hides under rocks. So it was just a matter of flipping the right one. So Tim, this is what's considered seepage. Here, Mark, take a look at this. See all this water here, just in this low spot? Yeah. This is actually seeping out from the hillsides, right? Yep. So Tim tells me that this rock right here is a great example of something we should flip that may have a crayfish underneath. And I can see this is all real moist right here. You see all this water? It looks like we're just on leaves, but you peel the leaves back and you've got water. So there could actually be a crayfish under this rock. Oh, there's a lot of water there. I guess I just put my hand in there and see if there's anything in it. Oh, there's definitely a burrow right there. Oh, but no crayfish. All right, let's keep going. From rock to rock we searched, gently flipping each one and placing it right back in the exact same spot so that we did not alter the design of the environment. Oh, jeez. Whoa, what is that? That's a huge slimy salamander. Oh, and it is slippery. Oh, come here. Got it, got it. I got it, yes. Wow, that is an enormous slimy salamander. That's probably the biggest one I have ever seen. Now they're called slimy salamanders because ugh, they excrete a slime from their skin. It's almost like a slug. It is very, very sticky. Let me turn you like this. You gonna sit up on my fingers there? Wow, that is a giant salamander. Much bigger than the salamanders that we catch in Ohio. And look at that cool patterning. Almost looks like the spots of a spotted salamander. Now this is a lungless salamander species. They actually breathe through their skin. So I don't wanna handle it for too long. And you can see I'm trying not to actually handle it like grasp onto it because I don't want to take moisture from its skin, but just handling it a tiny bit and my fingers are extremely sticky. Now one cool thing about salamanders is that they can actually, while well, most varieties, can detach their tails. It's called caudal autonomy, the same thing that lizards are capable of doing and that helps them escape from predators and then that tail will rejuvenate itself. Well what a great find! It's not a blue crayfish, but still pretty cool to get this salamander up close for the cameras. All right, I'm gonna dip it in water, place it back under the rock, and we'll keep searching. Sound good? Great start. All right, here we go. Okay, here, come here, check this out. Oh, come on. Oh, I got one. Do you? I got one. one. Oh. Yes, but it's not blue. It's a crayfish, but it's not blue. Yeah, let's try it down and take a look. 
Oh, he's rearing up with those claws. Look at that. Ah, 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 oh man, every time. Yep, yeah, he's just holding on with those pinchers. Oh, the next pincher's about to pinch me too. All right, little buddy, I appreciate that. Can you uh, call ahead to some of your cousins who are blue? That's what we're really looking for. I knew I was gonna get pinched. Oh, man, it's one cool little crustacean though. A little fossorial crayfish. All right, back under the rock with this crayfish. And we're gonna continue searching. You can flip rocks for hours and come across nothing. But that's what makes it fun, because there's always going to be another rock. And all it takes is flipping the right rock to uncover a jewel of the wilderness. I'm telling you guys, you're not gonna believe how blue this little animal is until you actually see it. Actually, this rock right here, before we walk past it, looks perfect. That's a huge rock. I think you could do it, muscles, come on. Oh man, I don't think I can. You've been hitting the gym. I don't think I can lift that one. That's a two-hander. That's a weird beetle. I need to see it and see if it's possible. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, it's gonna be a whopper. Let's do it. That's a big rock right there. All right, here we go. I'm gonna lift it. You ready? One, two, three. Oh. oh. I got one. I got one. Holy oh my mackerel. There it is. Whoa. That is a blue crayfish. <laughs> I told you to go that rock. <laughs> Heavy rock and it paid off with a blue crayfish. Look at that thing. Okay, I'm gonna leave this rock positioned just like this. Okay, yeah, let's come over here. Let's back up to the trail. Wow. Yep, yeah, this is good, this is good. Look at that. Can you believe how blue that crayfish is? Hold on, I'm gonna turn it like this and kind of hold it by its tail. There it is, the sapphire of the West Virginia hillsides. It is so blue, I can't believe it. It is as blue as the sky is. Look at that crustacean. Wow. That must be the coolest looking crayfish I have ever seen. Now, this is a species that is subterranean, which means that they have burrows that can go down as deep as eight feet under the ground, and they will come up into those little pools of water underneath the rocks to search for food. Now, these crayfish do not grow to be very large. This is about average size, and it is a female, and the way that I can tell that is by looking at its underside. It does not have these little kind of grappling legs underneath there where if it was a male it would use to grasp onto a female and I can also tell that this one has a regenerated claw. If you didn't know this, most crustaceans, especially crayfish, are capable of losing claws and then they regenerate them. So this claw right here is a little bit smaller than that claw. So at some point, a predator likely tried to eat it, it dropped its claw and then it managed to escape. And now that claw is growing back. So I heard that these crayfish, they can actually drown in water. So if you found one of these, you wouldn't want to release it in the stream. No, they go in water. Their burrows oftentimes are filled with water, but they have to keep coming to the surface to breathe. Now they do have gills, just like aquatic crayfish, but those gills allow them to breathe air. So you may be wondering to yourself, Coyote, don't you need to put this thing back into the water? Is it gonna suffocate by being out in the open air? No, not at all. This crayfish is breathing right now. So Coyote, we actually need to get some data while we're out here, correct? That's right. It is possible that this is a new subspecies of this crayfish. Now, there are two recognized species, and it is possible that this one could be a third. So what we're gonna do is take some really detailed photographs and mark the GPS coordinates, and you never know, this may be a completely newly discovered crayfish. How cool would that be? That would be awesome. Do you think they'll let us name it? Maybe, and if we were able to name it, I would call it the sapphire crayfish because in my opinion, this is a lost jewel here in the hillsides of West Virginia. Coyote Pack, what do you guys think? The sapphire crayfish? I like it. Well, I would say it was a pretty epic adventure today. We flipped over many rocks, we found salamanders, we found a brown crayfish, and then of course, the last largest rock revealed to us this little blue beauty. The blue crayfish is one of the most uniquely colored animals we have ever come across. Its elusive nature and subterranean dwelling made it difficult to find, but in the end, the long search was completely worth it. As of the release of this episode, this subspecies of crayfish has officially been classified as a new discovery and is in the process of being described by scientists. And when it comes to the common name officially becoming the sapphire crayfish, well, that's still up for debate. And we are told there is a chance it may actually happen. So I'll continue to keep my fingers crossed. 
Over the years, we have featured a plethora of frog species. Some of them were tiny and poisonous. Some of them jumped on my face. Some of them were giant and screamy. There it is, the famous sound that they meow, make. Meow, meow, meow. Wow! And some of them were even semi-transparent. The point is that I was able to safely catch and successfully get them up close for the cameras so we could learn about what makes them so unique. But what if I told you that there was a frog that was impossible to catch and was also blue? <coughs> Hold up. A blue frog? Yes, you heard me right. A blue frog. This encounter happened on the island of Middle Bass, located in Lake Erie. The following series of events will play out in chronological order. Prepare yourselves because you are about to witness the unbelievable. Oh my gosh. What? Dude, that is a blue frog. Look at that frog. Where? Right there. Oh my gosh, we gotta catch this frog, guys. I, I can't believe what I'm looking at. This is insane. I've actually read about this before. This is insanely rare. Every once in a while, based on limitations within genetic dynamics, a frog will sometimes lose pigmentation through its genetic line and will be blue in coloration. I mean, we are talking about a literal unicorn right here. This is crazy. Oh, he moved. There he is, there he is. I still see him. Oh, he can't, he can't make it through there. Oh, whoa. Oh, 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 yes, yes. Maybe he'll come back this way. Still see him? No. Dude, that was crazy. That was crazy. Okay, hold on, I'm coming back to you. I think we need to come back at night. If we come back at night and we see that frog, I can spot mm. it with a flashlight, and I don't think it'll jump. I couldn't even get close. Okay. If we can catch that frog. Holy cow, that will be insane. A blue frog. I cannot believe what I just saw. If he comes back out at night, we're definitely gonna get him. Let's do it. So how do you catch the uncatchable frog? I'm gonna build a contraption. Well, when I chased after this frog, the first thing it did was hop across all the duckweed and disappear back Whoa. and into the swamp. And I've got this long wooden beam and I'm going to secure my net to the beam. If I don't have to touch the water, even better. Now bullfrogs have a tendency to breed pretty territorial. So I think even though the fact that I chased it back into the marsh, it's still going to return to that spot to defend its little claim right there. That is good and secure and will give me several more feet of reach. All right, guys, this is it. We're gonna catch ourselves a blue bullfrog. Okay, guys, sun has set. We're gonna catch ourselves a blue bullfrog. Okay, it's just down the way here. Let's uh, sneak up and see if it's back in its spot. There he is. Okay. Right there, he's way closer to me. Oh, shoot. This frog is definitely tough to catch. Definitely knows what we're on to him. Oh! Don't do it by hand. It's gonna be slippy. Use the net. Put it right under him. Oh! Okay, okay. You could go from behind. Hang on, let me get the light on him. There he goes, there he goes, right there, right there, right there. He's, he's going. Oh. oh! Oh, there he goes. I see him, I see him, I see him. Still there. Still there. I gotta go on the other side of my fence. Okay. I think we're gonna get him. The length of the net is now actually hurting me. Oh, 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 oh! No! Oh. No! Oh. Dang it! Gosh, he's way back in there. Did we lose him? I lost him. <sighs> Dang it! It was literally inches from my hand right here. I should have gone for the hand catch, man. I should have gone for the hand catch. 
Dude, he's all the way back here and there's reason I can't get him. Oh! But, but, here's the thing. We tried to catch him in daylight. He went all the way back there and came all the way right back to this spot. There's a good chance this frog will be back. I think I gotta catch him by hand. He's too smart for the net. This frog knows exactly what is happening. He's impossible to catch. This is crazy, absolutely crazy. Okay, this is day two. We are back to the spot where the blue bullfrog was spotted yesterday. And this morning it has returned to its territory, which certainly proves my theory that this frog is running this little pocket of water. Now, I can see the frog. I'm not going to try to catch it during daylight. It is way too smart. This may be the smartest frog I've ever encountered. I mean, it was playing cat and mouse with me last night. It was just a game. It led me back into the reeds. I got bitten up by mosquitoes. It was rough. I've never had a more difficult struggle catching a frog. So what we're gonna do is wait until sun gets low in the sky again, just at sunset, when this frog is back in the spot, I'm gonna come out and I'm gonna take another attempt. I will attempt with the net at first, but if it gets close, gotta use my hand. Last night, the frog was literally about a foot and a half away from me and I defaulted to the net. I should have gone with my gut and tried to catch it with my hand and I might've had it, but we're gonna give it one more shot tonight. Okay, here we go. The third attempt at catching the blue bullfrog. What I've done tonight is brought a smaller net plus the long extended net. Gotta up our chances. And if it's not with the net, it's going to be with my hand. Yes, that's him, that's him, that's him. You ready? Yep. You got him, you got him. Oh, 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 no! 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 What? No! Oh my gosh. Dude, you had him. Hold on. Let's rewind and slow it down. Look at the evasive maneuver this frog pulls off as it springs from inside the net and does a full nose dive back into the water and disappears beneath the duckweed. Now look at this. Freeze frame. Zoom in. My hand is less than an inch away from making a swooping and unbelievable catch. But I missed it. Ah, oh, it was so close. Dude, I had him. I know, I saw him. Are you kidding me? I can't believe that just happened. There's nothing more frustrating than literally having the frog you've been trying to catch for three days in your net and then have it spring out just as I was trying to get my hand in there to keep him locked in position. Ah, oh, don't got him yet. We're gonna keep trying. Is it day three? Day three, attempt number four. four? Mm -hmm. Official attempt number four. The blue frog is back walk over to the car and get the net. Do you guys believe in miracles? Is it possible to catch a blue frog? We're about to find out. This is it. It is our last day. Okay, let's see what happens. Okay. Oh, it's already on to us. That's it. There he goes, all the way back. I don't think we even had a chance. I literally wasn't even able to set foot in the water. The legend of the blue frog. There you go. Go back further. That's it. The blue frog is officially uncatchable. There is a frog that is not capable of being caught by Coyote Peterson. Well, maybe we'll have to return to Middle Bass Island at some point to see if the blue frog still manages to evade capture. The legend of the blue frog persists. 
Will we catch Bluey on our next adventure? Stay tuned. You're my boy, Blue. You're my boy. In the summer of 2020, I came upon a sight I never expected to see. Dude, that is a blue frog. Look at that frog. Where? Right there. Oh my gosh, we gotta catch this frog, guys. I, I can't believe what I'm looking at. This is insane. For three days, Mario and I pursued this frog. Day and night, we attempted to catch and share this beautiful blue beauty with the coyote pack. Yet this super spring-loaded creature outsmarted, outmaneuvered, and outplayed me like no frog I had ever been witness to. Coyote Peterson was truly defeated by a blue frog. I can't believe that just happened. I returned to the scene of my defeat several times in the following weeks, but the blue frog was nowhere to be found. The Phantom of Middle Bass had disappeared, and the legend was born. Then on a random trip back to the island, without any expectation of seeing this legendary frog, and with no proper camera team, a new blue was spotted. And I totally redeemed myself. Okay guys, so here's what's happened. Last night, I was out investigating the same swamp where I had seen a bullfrog once before, a blue bullfrog. You may remember an episode from a few weeks ago called Blue Frog Must See It to Believe It. Well. I didn't anticipate seeing that frog again considering I had scouted one other time. I was back last night and lo and behold, I found a different blue frog. No, this is not the same blue frog that evaded capture last time. This is another example of a frog that has gone through a color mutation. Now, it's not so much why is this frog blue, it's how did this frog become blue. It is blue because it has a color mutation known as a xanthism. Think of it like this. If you're mixing colors together, blue and yellow make green. The base layer of bullfrogs is actually blue, but this frog lacks a yellow pigmentation in its skin. If the base is blue and the second layer is yellow, when those mix together, that is why we perceive frogs as being green. This frog has a lack of that yellow pigmentation, which is what makes it appear to be sapphire. Now, a color abnormality like this can be rather frequent in nature, and it happens quite often in different amphibian species, not only in frogs, but also in salamanders. Although scientists predict that finding a blue bullfrog is about one in 30,000 frogs. So I definitely consider this quite the anomaly and a pretty incredible find. Uh, the reason that I'm guessing that there is genetic mutation happening here on Middle Bass Island is because this is a very isolated population of bullfrogs. There are very few predators other than herons and snapping turtles in this environment, which is allowing these frogs to just continuously reproduce. There are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of bullfrogs living in this marsh. So after a while, it's not unlikely that there's going to be some sort of mutation that happens where you have a color variation like this. I think we all remember the sapphire crayfish, and I think it would be uh, rather fitting to call this the sapphire bullfrog, but just so we're clear, this is not a new species. It is a true bullfrog, it just has a color mutation. Uh, the more this frog is out in the sun, warming itself up for the day, the brighter that blue color is going to get. When this amphibian is cold or it's hunkered down, they have the ability to shift the chromatophores in their skin, which of course can help keep them more camouflaged. Now the problem a blue frog like this faces is that it cannot camouflage properly. I'm actually really pleased to see that the frog has grown to this size to begin with. A lot of animals that do not have the proper coloration for their environment end up being easily predated upon by other predators. Now, the way that I caught this frog, which actually happened off camera, is I did shine it with a flashlight, but it wasn't in the water, it was actually up on land. I used the long extendable net, got the net over top of the frog, it was able to quickly pounce on top of it and get it scooped up. What I want to do now is give you guys an up-close comparison between the blue bullfrog and a normal green bullfrog. Now, these are the exact same species, about the same size, but you'll notice how different looking the blue mutation is from the green one. Let's start with the eyes. The eyes of the green bullfrog are bright amber in coloration surrounding that black pupil, but the blue bullfrog's eyes are almost completely black and brown. That again has to do with the lack of yellow pigmentation in this frog's body. 
When it comes to camouflage, there's no question about it. The green frog is gonna blend in much better within a swamp or marsh environment with lily pads and duckweed. The blue bullfrog, especially when you turn it sideways like this, you can see is so much more likely to stand out amongst a green environment. My theory on that as to why I was unable to catch the blue bullfrog last time is that they're more agile and more in tune with any movements within the environment. The second they feel the water shifting or a difference between light and shadows, they immediately think, oh no, I'm no longer hidden. Something's getting close. It may eat me. I better spring off into action and find myself a better hiding spot. I wonder if they're talking, saying to themselves, what are we doing right now? Are we being filmed? Were we abducted by aliens? Are we about to be famous on YouTube? Without question, this blue bullfrog is probably going to be the most famous frog we have ever filmed. Well, it's taken me several trips back to Middle Bass Island, but I was finally able to find and successfully catch the one and only blue bullfrog. All right, time to get these two hoppers back off into the swamp. A quick search of the internet will reveal that several blue frogs have shown up in 2020, including specimens sighted in Texas, Indiana, Louisiana, Iowa, and of course, Ohio. Some say these frogs are one in a million, which is probably pretty accurate considering the number of tadpoles that hatch out and grow into frogs every season. Yet while it is rarely witnessed due to the elusive nature of most amphibians, azanathism is relatively widespread in salamander and frog populations that have a limited gene pool, like frogs isolated to an island. For me, the summer of 2020 will always carry with it the memory of the blue frog. And if you ever get the chance to visit Middle Bass Island and find yourself walking along the marsh, who knows, maybe you too will be lucky enough to catch a glimpse of the sapphire bullfrog. As the rumble of thunder echoed through the mountains and flashes of lightning illuminated the sky, heavy rains poured down, saturating the wilds of South Africa. Tonight we are hunkered down at the Tainskloof Game Reserve, waiting for the storm to pass. When it does, the life-giving rains will have brought one mysterious creature out from hiding. Creepy, crawly, and completely harmless, this native arthropod definitely deserves a moment in the spotlight. Oh, Woo. he's awake. You guys got a lot of lights out here. It's a little late for lights, isn't it? No, it's the perfect time. Or you guys wanna go searching for creatures? Oh yeah. Well, the good news is that we're on location right now in South Africa, staying at the Reserve Protection Agency's headquarters. And earlier today, some rain moved through, which means that the animals are gonna be moving about. Yes. Now, I heard a rumor that there's a little creepy crawly that may be out tonight called the Shongololo. Oh, so, the, what? The Shongololo. Sounds crazy, right? Could be creepy, could be crawly, and if you guys are ready, get the flashlights on, see if we can get one up close for the cameras. You guys ready? Let's do it. All right, here we go. All right, let's venture out from under the overhang and into the mist. Can you see that mist coming down? Yeah, I can. I know, it looks like we're in Costa Rica right now, not South Africa. And here you go, if you crouch down, point your camera at the ground, bring the lights down here, you'll notice how much moisture is in this grass. And we're in the dry season right now. And what's crazy is that I think we brought the rain from Ohio. I was expecting arid terrain and lizards and reptiles all over the place. And so far, we've been wet this entire trip. Over here, we've got a rock structure. All those little nooks and crevices are the perfect place to find the myriapod that I'm after tonight. You guys ready? Let's do it. Let's go search. All these crevices are the perfect place to look. You see all this moisture just spilling down the rock sides. We're looking for the Shunga, what's Shungalolo. it, what is it again? Shungalolo. And how do you spell that? S-H-O-N-G-O-L-O-L-O. Shungalolo. Wow, I'm actually impressed. Oh, right here, right here. That didn't take us long. Now you may be looking at that thinking to yourself, that's a millipede. Shongololo is the indigenous name here in South Africa for the millipede. Now this is a big black one. Come here, buddy. I'm gonna pick it up very gently. Oh, buddy, look at that guy. Now, there are several different species in this area and this is actually not the one that we are looking for. This one is just completely black in coloration. Actually, it looks a lot like the millipede that we found in Arizona. It does a bit. Now, there are 8,000 species of millipede worldwide, and the ones here in South Africa are bigger, and in many instances, more 
brightly colored. Now, I'm gonna place this one back. This is, you may be thinking, man, that's a big millipede. Why don't we film that one? Trust me, guys, when you see the millipede that I'm after, it is much more impressive looking. All right, I'm gonna place this one back down on his rock. You ready? Yep. All right, little buddy. Let's check this plant structure as well. Good place for snakes, maybe some frogs. Oh, Shongalolo! Got one? Two of them! You got two? This is the one we're looking for, the red and black millipede. Can you guys see it? Oh yeah, man, that's awesome. You got one here and one right down there. Wow, they're about equal size. They are big, but this is exactly the species that we were looking for. Now, I'm gonna gently take one of these off the tree. Let's take it under an overhang and get up close for the camera. Sound good? Sounds good, yeah, we should get out of this rain it's starting to really come down. I wanna be very gentle with this. And got it. Nice. Wow, it really is red. Oh yeah, and unlike the centipede, I don't have to worry about being bitten by this creature. Okay, let's go up here under the overhang and get it up close for the cameras. Okay. Well, that certainly didn't take us too long. There you have it, the red and black millipede one of the most iconic millipede species that you can find here in South Africa. Now this one's pretty good size. They do get a bit bigger than this, but for getting one in front of the cameras, this certainly will work. Now I'm free handling this millipede and this is completely safe. Unlike centipedes, they do not bite, so I have nothing to worry about here. Now, similar to insects and arachnids, they are arthropods, but both centipedes and millipedes are part of a superclass known as myriapods. To some species, they are considered toxic. However, to humans, if you eat one of these, you're gonna get sick, but it's not gonna kill you. Not that I can imagine you'd ever want to eat a millipede. Now, the millipede is the perfect little recycling creature in nature. And what they're doing is breaking down all the decomposing plant matter that you'll find out there on the forest floor, whether it be leaves, mushrooms, or anything else that's decomposing. Honestly, sometimes even dead animals, they will help break that down and return it to the ecosystem. Now, the way that these creatures breathe is through a series of small holes that run along the side of the body called spiracles. And they are very, very fragile considering the fact that they have this rigid exoskeleton. If it gets too hot, so if this creature finds itself out during the daylight, it can actually cook from the inside out. It's also very susceptible to water. So if it gets into an area where too much rainfall comes down, they drown very easily. So while it may be prehistoric looking in nature and it's been here for millions of years, it's actually pretty fragile when you when you break it all down. Now here's something that's cool, and the reason I wanted to feature this millipede is because it is red and black. And that red coloration, as you guys know, my favorite saying, aposomatic coloration, is a warning to any potential predator that I may be toxic. I'm not sure exactly how toxic this variety is, but given that coloration, I'm willing to bet that it is not something that you want to chomp down on. Now, the name millipede means a thousand legs. However, there is no millipede species in the world that actually has a thousand legs. In fact, the millipede with the most number of legs counts around 400. Do we want to take the time to count this millipede's legs? Um, I don't think so, but <laughs> if I hold it up like this and show you its underside, you can see that each individual segment has two pairs of legs. As this creature grows, each section grows every time it sheds its exoskeleton. So if you're out there walking through the underbrush and you see a millipede and it looks like it's completely white, that's actually not a dead millipede, but an exoskeleton that was left behind after a shedding. That's so cool, the way that they move. Just a wave at a time with those legs. Now you see those two little antenna-like structure up front? Those are actually sensory organs that help them explore their environment. Those help it find its food and also can detect potential predators. So why do they come out in so many numbers? Well, it's called a drove when they come out. So when the rain comes in, it moistens up the soil and they come out from underneath the leaf litter. And what they're doing right now, because everything is moist, is they're getting the opportunity to feed, their opportunity to lay eggs, and their opportunity to do what they do, which is break down the environment. Now they do have little mouth parts, so Unlike a centipede, they don't have those big front pinching mandibles that can inject venom, but those little mouth parts are used to break down their food. They don't have proper eyes, but they do have eyes that are capable of sensing light. So as the daylight creeps in, they begin to realize, okay, I better tuck back down underneath a log or rock so that I don't end up getting cooked. Now, 
you know, they don't move very fast, Coyote, but they actually can cover some ground. They really can. And you can see that about four or five sets of legs move at a time, almost like a wave type motion. And if they need to escape from something quickly, they can move up to 20 sets of those legs at one time. But in this instance, it feels pretty calm. It's just trying to sense the environment by feeling my hand and see it's, it's looking for its next point of purchase. There you go. As long as I just keep placing my hands out in front of the millipede, it will have something else to walk onto. Well, it certainly didn't take much searching for us to get the red and black millipede, also known as the Shongololo, up close for the cameras. South Africa is home to some of the world's largest and most iconic animals, including giraffes, elephants, and rhinos. Yet oftentimes it's the smaller creatures, such as the Shongololo, that manage to go uncelebrated. So while they are creepy looking, without question crawly, and likely to give you a scare if you just stumble upon one, these harmless and beautifully colored millipedes are certainly a sight to see. And the good news is that if you do see one, it means that the much needed rains have likely returned to bless Africa. Do you guys want to see something really scary? No. Yes, you do. Come on, let's go down to the river. <laughs> I don't know if this is such a good idea. Oh, I'm about to show you guys the scariest thing you have ever seen. I've been thinking about this all day. I found one earlier, but at night, it'd be a whole lot better. So where are you really taking us? To the river. What? You know, rivers at night can be really pretty scary. So what we're gonna do is go all the way through the deep dark woods and down to the river. Let's find some creatures. <laughs> Ooh. What do you see? Eyeballs. Where? You see that way out there? Where? <gasps> Those are eyes. Let me see if I can see that on camera. What is that? Mario, what is that? Oh, I can see him on camera. Mario, what? wildlife biologist, identify, identify. Those are eyes, guys. Uh, well, the most logical oh. thing is a deer, but we are in Bigfoot territory. It could be a Sasquatch. Come on, let's go that way. We're being Wait. watched, guys. We're being watched. Mario. We're being watched. I can see the eyes. Oh man, there's like a creepy old shed out here. Yep. You don't want to go in the shed. I think we've seen too many horror movies to know how these all begin. It kind of feels, feels like, like that, doesn't it? Yeah, an old rusty shed. An old shed in the middle of nowhere in West Virginia. This never ends well for the people that go out with cameras and flashlights, does it? Yeah. See all this moisture in the grass? This means that they're gonna be out and about tonight. They? It's a really good sign, they, yes. Where there's more than one? There will definitely be more than one. But all it's gonna take is one to find out how bad the bite is. That? Did you hear that? No, not your foot. Oh. It sounded like rocks knocking together. What does that mean? That's actually a definitive sign of a Sasquatch calling. But that's not what we're after tonight. The odds of us seeing Bigfoot, slim to none. If we do see one, we're gonna film it. But we wanna get to the river, and I can hear it from here. Come on, just over this ridge. Ooh, this is creepy. It's like a beach. Where's the water? I thought I heard something, sir. See all kinds of reflective eyes. All right, I need a big flat rock. To defend ourselves with? No. To look under. Uh -oh. Not there. OK, let's venture up this way a little bit. Oh. Oh. What is it? There's one right here. What? Ah! What is there it? There it is! Ah! Oh, gross! Ah! Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Under the rock, under the rock. Ah, I got it! Ah, ah, ah! Oh, it's trying to bite me! 
There it is. What is that? It's a Helgramite. Oh, mackerel. That's a big one, too. Wow. All right, guys. Well, if you remember an Instagram post I made a few weeks ago of a creature that looks. Ah! It's biting me. Okay, they do bite. There you have it. Everybody want to know, do they bite? Yes, they do bite. It is latched onto my finger right now. Oh, that hurts. But it's not breaking skin. That's, uh, oh, ah. Ooh, it's got a hold of me. Now, the Helgramite, can you see it okay there? Oh, yeah. It's got a hold of me. The Helgramite is actually the larva stage of the Dobson fly. Now, the Dobson fly may be thinking to yourself, oh, well, is that maybe some beautiful butterfly type creature? No, it's about as wicked looking as this thing is, only with big wings and enormous front mandibles. However, those mandibles aren't strong enough to pinch and bite onto anything like the larva stage. Now, I'm gonna turn it slightly like this. Wow. Yeah. Oh, it is just latched. <sighs> Now, if the bite isn't enough, what they will also do to deter a predator is squirt a nasty smelling musk from their rear end. And it actually smells just like human feces and- Ew, what? It smells oh, like, it smells like- Oh, like poop, exactly like poop. Oh, and it is oh already God. squirted musk all over my finger. Oh, it absolutely stinks. Ah, 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 ah. Biting down harder. That is about the most alien looking creature I think I have ever come across. Like something out of the show Stranger Things. Ugh. Okay, it's been latched onto my finger for a while now, and what I'm gonna do is just gently dip it into the water. Now they are semi-aquatic, so putting in the water isn't gonna cause any issues, but I do wanna get it off of my finger. All right, here, try this. I'm just gonna set it down gently. So just like I get crayfish off of me. Oh, he's not letting go. Go. Ow! Oh, it's biting out harder. Ow! There it goes. Got it. Okay. Ah! Oh, bit me again. Man. Ah, there we go. Can't catch a break. Okay. Now let's take a good look at the anatomy of this creature. Look at that underside. Wow, that is gnarly. This is like a mix between a scorpion, a centipede, a water bug and a tremor. Wait, look at its mouth. That was on your finger. Yeah, those front mandibles right there, can you see that? Those were latched onto my finger. Yikes. And these two back appendages there have hooks on them, just like the rear hooks on a centipede. Ooh. See that, how they move backwards? Ow! No! Ah, he's got me right underneath the fingernail. I'm gonna hold him there, though. All right, now he's hooked down to me. Oh, there, let go. There, look at that. Oh, wow, that is so bizarre. I don't know how you're leaving this Ow, oh, it's like an alien. Ah! Ugh. Oh, it has all these little hooks on its arms. Just the way it moves. Ugh. It, like, slinks. What did I tell you? It's like a, night, a living nightmare. Look at that. Oh, it's hooked onto me. Oh, where'd it go? Where'd it go? Can you imagine what it would be like to have one of these things crawl into your ear? It's gonna eat your brain. No, 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 no. Ow! Ah! Ooh, that actually really hurts. Oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. Looks pretty good, dude. I think it's actually poked a hole in my ear. Ah! Ow! What do you guys think? Helgamite earrings? Can this be the new look? <laughs> no. That's Is it dangling down from my ear? Oh, yeah. Ah! Here, can you tur turn to the... Oh, my gosh. Hold on, hold it there. What if it went in your brain? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I got to get it off my ear. Uh, now... Oh! Ooh! Wow, your ears are a lot softer than your finger. Mmm, that hurts. So at this point, I pretty much just have to wait for it to drop off on its own. So you can't just take it off? Well, if I touch it or pull on it, it's going to just bite down harder. All right, let's, uh, do you want me to try to get it off? Uh, let me see. Ooh. Ow! Oh, let's see it, Hope. trim your ear. Oh, wow, yeah. Is it bleeding? It's got a good crease, there's a little white speck. Ouch. Well, I would say that this, without question, is the creepiest looking creature that we have come across here in West Virginia. All right, back under your rock, little creeper.
Oftentimes we fear things that have a creepy and alien looking appearance. Even I'll admit, the moment I found my first Helgramite, I was incredibly nervous to pick it up, especially with that set of intimidating mandibles. However, in the end, I think what we all learned is that while this creature may look intimidating, it's non-venomous and its bark is far worse than its bite. Do you know what's creepier than one Helgramite? 25 Helgramites. <laughs> what's that for? Well, what Mark doesn't know is that earlier today, when I was down by the river and I found the first Helgramite, I also found 25 of them. And I'm gonna make Mark put his hand in this bowl full of them. Hey, Mark. Really? Well, that's cool. So you know how early we started this and I was like, hey, you know what I found today? Mm -hmm. Something really gross. Yeah, I know, the Helgramites. Yeah, the Helgramites, right? And that was super gross. Well, I kind of didn't tell you the whole truth. Okay. I found one Helgramite. And then I kept flipping over rocks and I found 25 Helgramites. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> so what gross. I challenge you to do right now Oh my gosh, you really did. Is put your hand into this bowl and see if you get bitten by a Helgramite. No, no, no. Yeah, come no, on. No. I got Guys, stung by a bullet on. ant. Come on. I was stung by a bullet ant, and I just want you to put your hand in there for 60 seconds. 60 seconds? Yeah, you guys always tell me, can you last for 60 seconds? Can you last for 60 seconds with your hand in a bowl of Helgramites? Ooh. I'll count it down for you, ready? Wait, who signed me up for this? I didn't agree to this. Yeah, well, you know, Mario and I were kind of like, you know, it would be really fun getting Mark finally bitten by something. <laughs> and it's not that bad. I was even bitten on the ear and it didn't break skin. Let me see these. One, two, three. There's 25 yeah, there's of them. There's definitely 25 in there. That's so gross. Okay, so you, you know what the line is, right? Uh, no, I don't. What is the You got to say your name. <laughs> and I'm about to enter the bite zone with the Helgramite. And then you got to just place one of your hands in there and let them crawl all over you for 60 seconds. I don't know, man. I mean, do you sure you don't want me to film this? Mario, come on. No, 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 no. <laughs> Put you here. Give me your camera. All right. You're going to take... film it? I'm not going to film it, just so you don't drop your camera right, in case you get bitten. Let's put it yeah, let, let's, get it, let's get ourselves situated. Get on the ground. We'll have a little setup. And we're going to do this just like a normal scene here. All right. I did find a center, a millipede by Did you? Yeah, it's good. Uh, we don't care that you found a millipede. We care about you getting bitten by Helgramites. Do you have a good shot? Yeah. I was kind of hoping you'd say no. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. All right, Coyote Pack. Mark is going to do it. Okay. Director of Breaking Trail is going to enter the bite zone. Okay. I'm Director Mark, and I'm about to enter the bite zone with 25 Helgramites. All right. I can't watch this. Put your hand in there. Come on. One, two, three. Oh, it's so creepy. <laughs> All up on you there. Oh, they're pooping on you. Ah, scuff it. Oh, good. oh no. Oh, there's another one. Oh, God. Keep your hand in there. Keep your hand in there. All the way in the bowl. All the way in the bowl. That's about 30 oh, seconds. Oh, there's another bite. Oh, there's another one bite. See my finger. Uh, yeah, that's right. Oh, there's another bite. <laughs> oh, they're biting me. Dude. Ah. Three, two, it actually does hurt. one. All right, let him out. Ah. Oh, oh, hold on. Hold. Oh, look at that. It's latched onto him. Let me get it. Ah. <laughs> yeah. That's not oh, your hand. Oh, my gosh. Oh, Mario, smell my hand. Oh, <laughs> well, there oh. you had it. Good job, buddy. I'll give you a stinky um, high five. I'm like, I'm like shaking, man. That's it like hurts that. a little bit, right? No, it's just super, super creepy. <laughs> I saw that one really got the yeah. side of your finger pretty good. Oh, they're biting me. Oh, man. Well, well. we're going to let all these little Helgramites go back off into the wild, and they're going to metamorphosize into Dobson flies. And then they're going to be flying everywhere. Absolutely. Ugh. I think right. I just got some of that in my eye. Ugh. All right, guys, I gotta wash my hands. Yeah. <laughs> there they go. Look at them go. The Costa Rican rainforest is considered to be one of the most biologically diverse ecosystems on the planet. Home to literally thousands of species, the crew and I have been fortunate enough to encounter some of its most iconic animals from the striking red-eye leaf frog to the adorable ocelot. Now she has found the microphone. Oh. 
No, no. When exploring in Central America, one of our favorite places to visit is the Costa Rican Amphibian Research Reserve, which is famous for having some incredibly rare and almost never seen creatures. Mark, Mark, come here. What is it? Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. What do you got? You are not gonna believe this. Oh my gosh. And while I have been present for nearly all of these initial finds, every once in a while, Mark and Mario stumble upon an animal without me. And on this rainy evening, they just so happen to encounter what may be considered the rarest animal we have ever found in the rainforest. Mario! Matt, yeah. Come look what I found. What? What'd you get? I've got a giant ornithopra, the what? rare one. Oh, man. Right here on this rock. This is the one that's on the wall in the cabin. Yeah, that totally is. We, what do we do? Um, Coyote's not even here. What do we do? We just film it? Uh, well, certainly we have to film it. I've got a container in my backpack. Um, we could contain it, take it back to the lodge, have Coyote check it out, and uh, we get some great B-roll shots. All right, we have to, right? Yeah. We have to. We'll, oh, yeah. we'll bring it back. Yeah, we'll bring it right back after, and uh, that'll be awesome. Dude. Great find, dude. Wow. OK, so. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Be gentle. Careful, careful. Be careful. You know, those things can spray stuff. Ooh. It was very velvety. Hold on, I gotta touch it. Let me see. Oh, it's so cool. All right, yeah? let's go. I'm so excited. All right, let's I, do can, it. I can hardly stand still. Let's go. Secured. Yes. Woo. Peyote. Peyote. Guys, find anything cool to photograph? Uh, yeah, maybe. Maybe. Show. Check out what Mark found. So. Get out of here! We found You were kidding me! We found it on the rock, like four paces where we found the brown one. Yeah. Get out of here, I cannot believe that. Go inside and get the get the picture, show everybody. So, oh yeah. my gosh! <laughs> I cannot believe you guys found the holy grail! Oh my goodness, guys, they found <laughs> an Good ex good good, you know, that, that's what we were looking for. <laughs> that reaction. Get out of town! We, we've been we've been what? just like jumping for joy the whole way home. Look at it. Yep, there it is. So we brought it back. Uh, what we want to do is we want to build a little film set. Ooh, that's a great idea. Oh, you know what we should do? Like a Planet Earth type shoot where we set yes. it up on a little table. I've got the little table up here. We'll get some moss, get some logs, set it up, and do a presentation. Absolutely. This will kind of be like the mole cricket episode, only with a much rarer animal. Yeah. Oh my gosh! I can't believe you found it. This is insane! So wait, who found it? You found it? Yeah, I, I mean, we, dude, yeah. we just filmed the people. <sighs> yeah. Woo! This is crazy! Not a bad gig, Coyote, when you can do your job and wear sandals. I do. I got my sandals on. I don't even have my snake boots. I mean, I was working on the Orca script and uh, just kind of lounging. I saw the rain start to come down. I was like, man, these guys better hurry back before those cameras get soaked. Let me see if I can get it to just stay totally calm on my hand. Whoa, you are looking at the velvet worm. Quite possibly the rarest creature you can come across in the Costa Rican rainforest. This creature's ancestors date back 500 million years to the Cambrian period. That is before the time of the dinosaurs. Now, this was one of the first terrestrial creatures to ever walk this planet. And even to this day, they are strictly terrestrial, which means that they stay on land. Now let's talk about where this animal gets its name from, the velvet worm. Believe it or not, this creature feels just like velvet. Now it does not have any hard outer exoskeleton like an arthropod, but in fact has a very soft, squishy body. Almost feels like a gummy worm. But if you pet it very gently, go ahead, Mark, put your hand out there, tell everybody at home, feels just like velvet. Oh, wow. Yeah, so like, like soft. a crushed velvet suit. So soft. Yeah, it's so cool. Here's something really cool. They are actually capable of shedding the outer layer of skin around once a month, just like a snake. And when they do shed that, they basically walk out of the skin, similar to the way a snake slithers out of its skin, and then they're even softer and more brilliantly bright. Oh, it's so cool. Let's take a look at the anatomy of this animal. Now, it looks like a mix between a caterpillar, a worm, and a slug, but onycophron is actually its own phylum, right? And there are close to 200 of them 
worldwide. However, scientists don't even know how many truly exist because they are very rarely seen. This is a nocturnal creature, and the fact that, Mark, you and Mario just stumbled upon it tonight is why they're so hard to find, because oftentimes they're out on rainy nights when most people aren't out venturing around. Now, despite the fact that this creature is actually kind of cute, believe it or not, it is a voracious predator. And the way that they hunt is they slowly move through the rainforest floor, forging amongst leaves and dead logs, and they'll use those two front sensory organs to kind of tap on their prey. And as soon as they sense something to eat, this is crazy. They have two glands on the side of their face that shoot out a sticky slime. It's like Spider-Man's webbing, right? And it is so incredibly strong that it can immediately pin the prey down. It actually shoots out in two streams and those streams will cross creating a net. So let's say it's a small beetle. It will go shoot out those two streams, tangle up the beetle, and then slowly walk up on top of it. And they have a little mouth up front. I don't know if you'll be able to see that or not, but inside that mouth is a single tooth that is like a razor blade. They insert that tooth into their victim, and then they leak in saliva. That saliva is similar to the saliva of a giant water bug, and it slowly breaks down the insides of their prey, and they drink it up just like a milkshake. Are you afraid of being bit right now? No, its tooth is much too small to potentially bite me, and they're not aggressive in any way whatsoever. It's not like a centipede or a water bug. This is something that is completely safe to handle. However, it's incredibly fragile. So as you can see, I'm trying to be just as careful as possible. I also don't want it to shoot me with that sticky slime because it's just like glue. Now, is it toxic, the slime? Does it, does it like poison you, or what does as, it do? As far as I know, everything I've read, no. The slime is completely harmless. So if it does get slime on me, I'm gonna be absolutely fine. Now, each one of those little stub feet has two little hooked claws. They almost look like cat's claws, and they use those to hold on to rigid surfaces when they're moving over, like, let's say, a log or a dry branch. However, if they're walking on something moist and soft, like moss, those claws retract in, and they have these little tiny soft pads on the ends of their feet. I can actually feel it gripping onto my hand, and it doesn't hurt at all, but it feels really interesting because those legs on each side move in unison with one another. And just like a worm, and remember, this is not related to a worm, but like a worm, it has a very soft body, and it's the expanding and contraction of the muscles inside of its body that allow it to get longer if it needs to. So like, let's say it's moving through some crevices in a log, it can stretch its body out and get itself completely out of a sticky situation. Oh, hi there, buddy. I see you. And look at the strength of its body. It can completely extend itself out just like we've seen millipedes do in the past, searching for the next move to make. And there it goes, right up on my fingers. Wow. Lucky night in the rainforest. Man, that thing is so cool. All right, well, you built a pretty awesome little set here, Coyote. Yeah, I think this is a good opportunity for us to get this velvet worm down on the miniature set and start filming some epic B-roll. You guys ready? Let's do it. All right, let's get the voiceover going and turn this into a Planet Earth episode. The red velvet worm is a creature that is almost never seen in the wild with human eyes. Their elusive nature and nocturnal lifestyle, combined with their tendency to exist in only remote areas of the rainforest, make encountering them nearly impossible. To our knowledge, we are one of the only teams to have ever captured video footage of this animal. So having this opportunity was truly a once in a lifetime. This lucky moment will now be held near the top of our greatest memories we as animal enthusiasts will forever carry with us. And we are incredibly proud that we have now been able to share this encounter with each and every one of you. What an absolutely incredible night. Getting the holy grail of bizarre rainforest creatures, the red velvet worm, up close for the cameras. All right guys, here we are. Back at the rock where we found this amazing rainforest creature, the Ornicophila. By far the coolest animal I've ever found. The coyote was pretty impressed. And jealous. Yeah, maybe a little jealous. 
but man, we had a great night. All right, buddy. Right back where we found you, just like we promised. Venturing into the nighttime desert is not for the faint of heart, as this cactus-strewn ecosystem is laced with a plethora of nocturnal predators. Whether it be scorpions, spiders, that right there is a black widow, sulpigids, or vinegaroons, these arachnids are certain to be on the prowl as they use the cover of darkness to silently hunt for their prey. Look at that! Does that thing not look like an alien? All arachnids come equipped with eight legs, and most are also armed with a set of fangs or a venom-injecting stinger. That is the most venomous species of scorpion in the United States, and he's on my hand. All right, this makes me a little bit nervous. I want to see if I can get him to just sit still. However, if eight legs, fangs, and stingers aren't enough to scare you, Arizona's Sonoran Desert is also home to a subphylum of creatures with even more legs, the myriapods which consists of centipedes and millipedes. At the end of the day, both of these animals do their best to avoid humans. However, today we are going to capture one of each so we can get them in front of the cameras for an up-close comparison. First, let's talk about the desert millipede. Now, millipede means thousand feet. And each one of these little body segments has two pairs of legs on it. Now there's no way that I'm going to get underneath this creature and count its legs, but I can tell you from it crawling across my arm that there are a ton of them tickling me right now. It feels like a bunch of little tiny pieces of Velcro grabbing onto your arm hairs. Despite the name, there isn't actually a species of millipede on the planet that has a thousand feet. On average they have around 400, with the record being 750, more than any other animal in the world. These myriapods have very poor eyesight. They have very simple eyes up front, so they're really using these antenna to help them navigate through the environment. And you'll see as he dances up in the air like that, he's basically looking for what his next move is going to be. If he can't feel anything with those antenna, he's kind of like, whoa, whoa, I've run out of road here. And until he bumps into something that he can walk on, he's just gonna stay put until he can get those front legs planted. Now, the millipede doesn't have many predators, and that's because these little myriapods are actually poisonous. They do have glands that run along the side of their body, and if they are really, really threatened, they will secrete a nasty orange fluid, and it absolutely stinks. I actually got it all over my hands the other night. Now, if you get this poison on your skin, all you need to do is wash your hands with soap and water, and you'll be just fine. Now, I'm completely comfortable with millipedes. They don't bite. If it doesn't bite, it can crawl all over me all that it wants. But the centipede is a whole different ball game. And we're gonna get that guy out in a second and get a close look at that venomous little desert dweller. The desert millipede is virtually harmless to humans. And if you encounter one in the wild, just admire it from a safe distance. Okay, now we're on to the part of the episode that I have been dreading. There is no good way to do this. You just have to plop them out and go for it. All right, here we go, ready? Oh boy. Now he's kind of like, oh, I'm on the ground and I'm on the move. Desert centipedes can inflict a very painful and venomous bite. So I stress, never attempt what I am doing. Okay, there we go. Now that I have his head under control, and more importantly, those fangs, I feel a lot better about this situation. Oh, look at how creepy that little desert creature is. Now what's really interesting is that the centipede means 100 feet. Each species of centipede varies. There's no way that this one has 100 feet, but as they continue to grow and their body segments elongate, they grow more legs. Now, one major difference between the centipede and the millipede is that the centipede has a very flattened body. This allows them to fit into crevices between rocks and allows them to glide very quickly over the surface of the desert. Now, these are voracious predators. They are out here right now walking the washes and searching through the rocks for other animals. They will eat bugs, they will eat scorpions, they will eat lizards, and the ones that grow to the size of the giant desert centipede, they will even take rodents but the bite from a centipede of even this size is gonna put you into some incredible pain. That's why I wanna be as careful as possible while handling this myriapod. One really interesting feature about all centipedes is that you see the back end here, this rump? You have these two 
modified legs on the back end here, which have little hooks in them. And this back end is pretty much a false head. It's the same color as the head is, and these two little modified feet on the back end here have hooks on them. So let's say you're a predator and you're coming in and you're like, all right, I'm gonna get him, I'm gonna bite his head right off. These little modified feet go up in the air, boom, and you get pricked with those little spikes throws you off guard, the centipede spins around, and that's when you get a bite from those venomous fangs. This is not a creature that is very easy to consume. Centipede venom is not considered deadly to humans. However, the pain has been said to keep a full-grown man on the ground and in pain for several hours. Moral of the story, steer clear of centipedes. I hope everybody enjoyed this comparison, the desert centipede versus the desert millipede. Both species are native to the Sonoran Desert, and I suggest avoiding both because the centipede is venomous and the millipede is poisonous. Both of these myriapods play an important role in the ecosystem. And while they may be creepy and have a gazillion legs as compared to you and me, always try to remember that they are going to use each and every one to run in the opposite direction. There are many things to crawl in the night, and on this dark monsoon threatening evening, the crew and I were headed out into Arizona's Sonoran Desert to find such things. Our mission was to search out a dry, walkable wash, which is an area that water flows through the desert during a monsoon. A wash is a great place to look for creatures at night because animals would use it as a highway to either move up and down, or they have to cross it, moving from one section of the desert to another. And we're looking for a wash so that we can travel down it and hopefully encounter some cool creatures. One of the most likely candidates has been causing nightmares for centuries, and if we located a giant arachnid, the goal would be to get the cameras up close, and myself even closer. All sorts of little holes down here, uh, but I don't see anything yet. So the reason that I'm shining my light down the length of the wash is that spiders' eyes reflect light in the dark, and this will actually give them away and give me the advantage to get close to one and hopefully get my hands on it. All right, let's keep going and see if we can find one. Got a good set of eyes. Here you go, get the light on, get the light on. Got movement right up here by this rock. Look at that. Finally. All night I thought all we were gonna find is anthill mounds. And there you have it. One big spider. Wow. Okay, just kinda approach slow. That is a tarantula. Wow, we have been out here searching for what? A solid two hours now. Seen nothing but ants and moths flying around by our lights. And just when I thought we weren't gonna come across anything, you have it right here, and it is. This is a desert blonde tarantula. It's a male, and the way I can tell is that the males have dark brownish black legs, females have light tan legs, and this is about as big as they get. Males grow a little bit larger than the females. Now, I wanna stay as calm as possible in this situation. If I stay calm, the animal will stay calm and they actually use all these little hairs on their legs to kind of sense the ground as they're walking so it can feel all the vibrations in the ground. And you see that little defensive pose right there? He's pointing his abdomen up in the air and you see all those tiny little furs on the back of the abdomen? You get too close to those and those little hairs kind of flick off and they really cause a real kind of nasty itching sensation. I know for those of you out there who have arachnophobia, this is probably your worst nightmare. Wow, that is a big spider right there. Look at that. What a handsome fella. I feel all those little tiny hairs on his legs crawling up my arm. Hold on, I don't want you going up there. No, nope, I don't want you going up there. Now he is up and on my back. Is he on my back? He's on your backpack. This is one of the most common species here in the Sonoran Desert. Thankfully, they don't eat coyotes. And where is he? Is he off? There he is. He's going around. He's going oh, around cool. the corner. All right. All right. There we go. All right. I feel a little bit better now. now. These spiders are out this time of night. They're mostly nocturnal, trying to avoid the heat of the day by staying in burrows. And what they're looking for is insects. And a spider of this size could even take down small lizards or small rodents, believe it or not. Wow. Absolutely beautiful. All right. I'm going to put him down and gently pick him up so I can show you the underside and see if we can take a look at his fangs. But I wanna get him off of my arm for this. Come down here, buddy. There we go. Now, this is in no way 
causing any injury to the spider. It just will allow me to kind of get him up so you guys can see those fangs. I'll tell you what, if you're a moth or any of the other little bugs that run out here in this wash, you meet up with that set of fangs, it's gonna be the last meeting you ever have. I definitely don't want to be bitten by this spider. It is venomous and it's not a venom that's really gonna cause you any more discomfort than a bee sting, but still I want to be as careful as possible. Arachnophobia is one of the most common fears that people suffer from. Obviously, I'm not afraid of spiders, but I won't lie, holding a tarantula of this size definitely gets my heart racing. Have you guys ever seen a spider this big? Have you ever held a spider this big? Tell me about it in the comment section below. All right, I'll put this big guy back into the wash so you can go feast on some beetles. See you later, fuzzy butt. You know, normally on a day like this, I'd be out there in the lily pads catching snapping turtles, but today, we're gonna do something a little different. Now, when we post these Dragon Tales episodes, a lot of you write in and say, Coyote, how many times have you been covered in leeches? And the answer to that question is absolutely never. In fact, in 20 years of catching turtles, being in swamps, ponds, lakes, ankle deep to neck deep, I have had virtually zero leeches end up on my body. The only time I think I've ever actually had a leech on me is when I've been holding a snapping turtle and one has actually crawled off the turtle and onto my hand. And even when they did, they would suction on, but they would never suck blood. I'm sure a lot of you have seen the movie Stand By Me. You know, that scene when the kids wander down into the swamp and get covered in leeches and they're like, ah, oh, we're being eaten alive. That does not happen. So what we're gonna do today is prove that not all leeches suck human blood. Now I'm sure you're thinking to yourselves, Coyote, I thought we were going to see some leech bites, and you just said, not all leeches suck human blood. And they don't, but I wouldn't let you guys down. So today we are going to test what happens when my arm goes into a container with two different species. What I have here are two separate containers. This one has your common freshwater leech, ones like we would find in the pond right behind me here. These live in North America, and in this hand, are the European medicinal leeches. These ones are from overseas, and trust me when I say that they absolutely love human blood. All right, what I'm gonna do now is dump the freshwater leeches into the container, and I'm gonna put my arm in there. You guys ready? Do it. Here you go, guys. Look at that. They are creepy looking, but I'm not nervous right now because I know that these leeches will not suck blood. Even if they attach to my arm, it's more of them being curious and testing out the environment than it is them wanting to get a meal. Moment of truth. My arm is about to go into the container with the freshwater leeches. Ready? Yep. One, two, three. And I said I wasn't nervous, but even still, putting your arm into a container with any leeches, definitely get your heart rate going. Oh boy, that one looks like it's actually going towards my arm right there, you see that? Most species of freshwater leeches, especially the ones that can be found in the United States, feed on small invertebrates or cold-blooded species like reptiles and amphibians. They are rather intelligent and this is something new in their environment. They're going right up to my arm and they're actually turning away. Look at that. I kept my arm submerged in the container for 15 minutes and wasn't bitten by a single leech. Okay, so I think at this point we have proven that the freshwater leeches have no interest in sucking my blood. Let's bring out the European medicinal leeches and see what happens with those. The next type of leech is native to Eurasia and is likely the most famous species as they have often been used in various medical procedures like reconstructive surgery. They live in muddy freshwater ecosystems and are notorious for feasting on blood. I just went and picked up the container of European medicinal leeches. You probably even change, you know, you probably even notice this change in the inflection of my voice. I am actually nervous at this point. Uh, these leeches are going to adhere to my arm and they are going to consume my blood. They haven't eaten in a few days and trust me when I say that they are hungry. All right, you ready for me to put them into the container, Mark? All right, release the beef. Here they go. All right, this is it. No turning back now. This is for science. Oh boy. A lot of leeches in there, Coyote. This is gonna be crazy. All right, I think it's about time to stick my arm into a container full of leeches. 
oh my gosh, they are just squirming all over the place. This is gonna be intense. Are we ready for me to be eaten alive by leeches? I think so. You're ready? Mark, you're ready. I yeah. know you're ready. Uh, the camera's ready. Camera's ready. Coyote pack? I feel like you're probably ready. All right. There's a lot of leeches in there. There's a lot of leeches. All right, so without further ado, I'm Coyote Peterson, and I'm about to be eaten alive by leeches. Ready? One, two, here we go, three. That gets your nerves going, that's for sure. Look at that, there's one already, boom. Just like that, instantaneous, secured to my arm. Holy mackerel. They're just like swarming towards my arm, look at that. One on my arm there, that's three. In a matter of seconds, my arm has been in here for, hold on, this one's like trying to go up my shirt, go this way. Boom, another one there on my hand. My heart is racing right now. Look at that, they are all over me. Ah! Oh, I can definitely feel something happening. Ooh, it feels like sandpaper grinding against my skin. My hand and arm have been in the water for about 60 seconds, and all but one leech is now on my arm. Now, the way that the leech's sucker works is they adhere on and they release from their saliva an anticoagulant enzyme. That enzyme not only numbs the skin, it also doesn't allow the blood to clot. Now, they have teeth that are kind of in the shape of a Y. Here, Mark, look at my fingers. It looks like this, the three teeth of a leech. They go like that and they slice into you. And I can feel them actually cutting into my arm. And look at that, look at how that leech is bent over. It is holding on with the posterior sucker, which is the tail, and it is consuming blood from the anterior sucker, which is the mouth. And holy cow, is this uncomfortable. Ugh. It has been about 20 minutes so far since my arm has been in the water. I'm gonna pan the camera down. Look at how big the leeches have gotten. They are completely swollen with blood at this point. At this juncture, I think these leeches have had enough of a feast. It's time to get them off of my hand and arm. Now there is a right way and a wrong way to remove a leech from your body. You may think, let me yank it off. Yanking it off is bad because you can actually pull their teeth out into the wound. Those teeth get left in the wound, you can end up with an infection. Now you may think to yourself, well, maybe I should put salt on it or put a lighter behind it and heat it up and it will be like, I'm scared, let me get out of here. That's also really bad because it will actually cause the leech to regurgitate some of its food into the wound. That also will cause an infection. Now the best way to remove a leech is to just use the edge of your finger. And what I wanna do is softly slide the anterior sucker off of the wound. Okay, you ready for that? So how do you know which is which? which well, it's obvious that this is the anterior side as you can see the back end is not attached to anything. And look at that leech. Oh, that one just popped off. Oop, Ooh. and that one popped off too. Look at that. Well, there's also the instance where the leech has eaten enough and it's going to just release itself on its own. Those two leeches are so full of blood, they are done eating. Look at how big that leech is. It is full of blood, and look at the blood just pouring out of my hand at this point. Wow. That leech basically said, okay, I'm done eating. Back into the water with me. What you wanna do is just gently slide your finger over the anterior sucker. There you go, look at that. I got the leech to pop off, and then I can just pop the posterior sucker off and plop back into the water with that leech. Oh, there we go. Ooh, that one hurts, look at that. You can see the blood just seeping out. Uh, there's four of them right there. This is going to be the bloodiest spot. You guys ready? One, two. Well, there you have it, the final leech. You guys ready? Dinner's over, buddy. Oh. The blood, it's like there's a lot of water in my blood. That's the anticoagulant just breaking down all the platelets and you can just see my blood almost looks really, really thin. And it's all about the amount of anticoagulant that actually went into my hand. I may be bleeding for hours at this point. 
my uh, hand is actually numb and that's how these leeches look at look at how big and fat and heavy they all are at the bottom of the tank there uh, the water is all red as you can see the drips of blood falling down into the water it's like a shark attack happened right here in this container. That's crazy. Well, I think ultimately at this point we have proven that while there are some species of leeches that will not give you a bloody bite, on the other hand, there are definitely some that will. There are nearly 700 species of leeches found on our planet. And the good news is that only a very small percentage would even consider consuming human blood. This is not an animal you ever need to be afraid of. They do not transmit diseases and have never been responsible for a human death. As for me, I took on a massive amount of anticoagulant and bled for nearly 24 hours. In the end, was it worth it? Well, if you no longer fear going into a lake or pond because we have proven that most North American freshwater leeches have no interest in drinking human blood, then I would definitely say that the answer is yes. Like clockwork, it's a guarantee that twice a day the tide will rise and the tide will fall. As it recedes, we have all learned that an incredible world of underwater marine animals become temporarily exposed, allowing any curious adventurer the opportunity to find and admire all sorts of bizarre creatures. In Harpswell, Maine, we came across one animal that we have been hoping to feature on Beyond the Tide since the series launched. But before we get to that alien looking water beast, let's take a look at something that is going to make your skin crawl. Dude, Mark, come here, check this out. What is it? Dude, this grass is like full of little tiny fleas or Whoa. something jumping. Look at that. Whoa, I'm standing. Oh, jeez. Look at that. Listen. You hear that? That's that like popcorn. Sounds like rain. I think those are sand fleas. Let me yeah. grab them. Do they bite? Uh, I believe so. All fleas, as far as I know, bite. I can't grab them. They're too small and fast. Jeez, they're jumping all over me. Here, come over here. Look at this. Let me check this grass. This might be better. Point your camera down right here. This is the exact same sort of seaweed, dried up seaweed stuff. Oh, hey, I see. Where? Look at that. I just step on them and they're everywhere. Watch. Ready? Yep. One, two. Oh my gosh! What? Look at that! Put what? Put my hand in there? Yeah, All right. All right, here, let me let me peel back some more. Oh, hey. uh, What's that like? Uh, that feels really weird. But they're not biting me. They're just jumping on me. Here, let me peel back this a little bit more. Look at that! There are like millions of them. Oh my gosh, that is crazy. Got one. Yeah. Look, look, look. Right there, can you see his little head sticking out? I believe that's a sand flea. Whoa. That is creepy. All right, note to self, don't lay on this beach. I'm just gonna disperse some of this dead seaweed back out and cover up the sand flea city. I've never seen anything like that. Millions upon millions of sand fleas. All right, let's head this way down the coastline and see what else we can find. As we continued down the coastline, we soon realized it was unlike any low tide scenario we had explored before. I carefully examined potential hiding spots where animals may be waiting for the tide to return. But so far, aside from thousands of fleas, I wasn't seeing a single living creature. The sun was getting low in the sky, when all of a sudden, our luck took the perfect turn and put us right in the midst of an animal we had always hoped to get up close for the cameras. Oh, it's a turtle! Oh, no, it's a horseshoe crab! What? Look at this! Is it alive? Oh, it is alive! Look at that! Yes! Wow, I Look thought that was a turtle! Oh my gosh, I just saw the lump! I thought it was a carapace! All right, let's do this. I'm gonna gently lift it up out of the grasses here. Let's see. Oh, it's strong! Look at that! Wow! What an look alien. at its tail going. Here, back up a little bit so I'm not sitting in the water. Whoa, look at that! Oh my goodness. That is a horseshoe crab. What a bizarre looking creature. 
Now you may be thinking, Coyote, is that thing going to pinch and bite you like crazy? No, they actually just have a little tiny mouth right in the center and they have no stinger, no fangs, no teeth. Look at that back tail there. Uh, they've gotten a bad reputation because of this tail. People think that that's venomous. It actually is not. Ow, 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 but the side little spikes there are definitely very, very spiny. Let me see if I can get it to just lay in the palm of my hand. Oh, that feels really, really creepy. Now, it's called a horseshoe crab, but it's not actually related to crabs at all. It's more closely related to spiders and scorpions. This is one large arthropod. Now, ooh, wait, ooh, it is pinching me a little bit. They do have these front pedipalps up front that they use to harvest food off of the basin of the ocean. Wow, I'm like so excited right now. Hold on, I gotta compose myself because I did not think we were gonna come across a horseshoe crab out here. Now, if you look straight on, where it gets the name horseshoe crab, let me hold it like that. Looks oh, yeah. just like a horseshoe, right? Totally. And if you look right at the front of the face there, you see these little spots? Those are compound eyes. Actually, this animal has nine eyes in total. The two right here, five light sensing eyes on top of its carapace, and then on the underside, two simple eyes that they actually use to kind of sense their environment. And scientists think that the eyes on the underside are actually just left over from when they were in a larva stage. So wait, those are eyes on the top of that? Yes, and it actually it looks like a face, doesn't it? You see that? I always thought that that was just like a helmet, like a shell protection. Well, the top of this animal is called the carapace, just like a lot of other arthropod species. This is a very dense, very hard exoskeleton. They don't actually have an endoskeleton, you know, bones and cartilage like a human, but on the underside, look at that, looks just like a scorpion or a spider. Whoa. Can I touch the uh, the top of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Curious. Totally How? safe. Is it tough? Yep. Oh, wow. Yep, exoskeleton. It's just like a turtle shell, actually. Yep, well, I thought it was a turtle when we first walked up, and look, you've got some sort of a barnacle growing up on top of it. It's covered in a little bit of algae and seaweed. Now, here's something that you may not know, and something very cool. Let me turn it like this and just hold it in the palm of my hand. That is me holding a living fossil. The ancestors of the horseshoe crab have been on the planet for over 450 million years. And this species right here is the Atlantic horseshoe crab. There's only four horseshoe crab species in the world. This is the only one that can be found off the coast of the United States. And this one specifically, this design, the Atlantic horseshoe crab, has not changed in over 230 million years. That dates back to the Triassic period. So this creature was crawling around on the basin of the ocean during the time of the dinosaurs. How cool is that? Now they do get quite a bit bigger than this, and I'm guessing this is a female. The females are about 25% larger than the males. Wow, it's almost impossible to hold on to. Look at the underside. It does look like a stinger. It does, and that's why people are afraid of these things. They think that they're gonna get stung. Look at this. Nope. This tail is actually just used like a rudder. Although it does have all these barbs, it's very intimidating, but it cannot hurt you at all. In fact, if a horseshoe crab gets flipped on its back like that, see it tries to right itself up, it actually can't. And that's a big misnomer that these arthropods are capable of flipping themselves back over. And there's actually a conservation effort that was launched uh, in the 80s called Just Flip Them. And the Just Flip Them concept is that if you're walking down the beach and you see a horseshoe crab that's flipped on its back like this from like a crashing of a wave, what you're supposed to do is just gently grab the carapace and flip it right side up. Now you don't want to pick it up by its tail because you can actually injure the animal if you hold it like that. Look at that, Mark, it's coming right towards you. Oh man. Do they ever come on land for anything or are they uh, purely aquatic? Well, between June and August, they come very close to shore to breed. And the way that they do that is the female will kind of nestle down in the rocks and a male will come in and latch himself onto the back of the female. Horseshoe crabs can breathe underwater or out of the water because a lot of the time when breeding's taking place, sometimes they're caught as the tide goes out too quickly and they can actually breathe air. Wow. I have really wanted to feature a horseshoe crab on Beyond the Tide, and it's kind of being in the right place at the right time that we came across one of these giants. Look at that thing. That's as big as my face is. Whoa, I do have to watch out for that tail, though. I don't want to get stabbed in the eye by it. Well, how cool was this? Coming across one of the most bizarre creatures you can ever stumble upon in the tide pools, the horseshoe crab. All right, let's let her back off into the ocean. Despite its angry appearance, intimidating spiked tail, 
and creepy set of legs and pinchers, the horseshoe crab is one of the friendliest marine animals you can stumble upon. If you see one in the wild, simply admire it from a respectful distance. If you see one flipped on its back, have no fear when it comes to picking the animal up and gently setting it back into the water. No matter how brave you may be, I am willing to bet that there is something you are afraid of. Fears, or phobias as they are known in the medical sciences community, can come in many shapes and sizes. When it comes to the fear of spiders, properly known as arachnophobia, I think it's safe to say that this fear also comes with many legs. What are you looking at? Look at this. That's a golden silk orb weaver. Look at the size of that spider. And that's a female, for sure. The males are smaller. Whoa, 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 there's more over here. Oh, the whole side of this house is covered in them. Look at this. Wow. Oh, look at man. this. Oh, look at they're all running. Oh, look at this one right here. There is a big spider. Oh boy. You know, it might be interesting. Why don't we do an episode like we did with the Black Widow, where I free handle one of these spiders to find out if it bites or not. What do you think? Oh man, they're definitely very impressive looking. Look at that. Yeah, a lot bigger than the Black Widow, that's for sure. I have handled many species of spiders. And whether they are huge and hairy, like the desert tarantula, or sleek and toxic, like the Black Widow, it never fails to send shivers down my spine as they skitter along my arms. Oh my. Getting right onto the edge of my finger. Oh boy, okay, now she's going down my arm. She's actually spun a little thread of web. Like she's becoming secured to me. Oh, I thought she was about to bite. One of my underlying goals has always been to help people face their fear of spiders. So today, I will be handling one of the most common, yet scariest looking arachnids in Central America, the golden orb weaver. But first, I have to catch one. Wow, that is a massive web. Look at the anchor points down here that then run all the way up into the hot zone. Now, this spider's got a good cache of food already stored up, but given the fact that there are not too many guard strands on the outside here, I think I might be able to actually catch this one. All right, should we go for it? Let's do it. Let me see if I can get her to come right down. Can you notice the her? Definitely her. Ah, I'm losing it. Got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. Nice. There we go. Whoa, that is a big spider right there. And I bet anybody watching right now who has arachnophobia is thinking to themselves, Coyote, you are absolutely crazy. Okay, let's bring it out here from under the overhang. There we go. Sting completely still on the stick. Look at that. Arachnid. Wow. One impressive specimen. Whoa. Okay. Going up to the top of the stick. Look at those hooked legs. That will make your skin crawl. Okay, Mark, give me that little plastic cube. Real slowly, before it drops down on me. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Let me see if I can get her to slowly walk in there. Okay. There we go. Whoa. Got it. Wow. That is one intimidating arachnid right there. All right, let's get this spider into a controlled situation and see just how dangerous it really is. Warning, spider bites can be incredibly dangerous and potentially fatal. Never attempt to catch or handle a spider. All right, now I am gonna keep my spider stick with me just in case I need to balance the animal on it at some point. Oh boy. You see it up in its web and you're like, oh, it's not that big until you get it inside of a clear plastic cube and it's right next to your face. It's a lot bigger up close and personal. All right, I'm going to take off my pack 
so I have a little more mobility. Now, like Arizona's Black Widow, this spider is oftentimes found in residential areas, and they build their webs all over man-made structures. So it's a species that you oftentimes stumble upon. However, because they're web builders, they stick to their webs. Now, people do encounter them because if you're out there in the rainforest, they oftentimes will span their webs between two trees. And like in one of those famous adventure movies, if you're walking through the rainforest at night, whack, you may walk straight into a web and find this spider on your person. Now these spiders are armed with a neurotoxic venom, which will attack the nervous system of their prey. And what these spiders are out here feasting on is any sort of insect that is unfortunate enough to fly into their webs. However, some of these spiders manage to grow large enough where they can actually take lizards, and I've seen pictures on the internet of ones that have eaten small birds and bats. How crazy is that? Now those are the ones that are in Australia. The ones here in Central and South America don't grow quite as big, and there are actually 23 recognized species worldwide. This actually spider people often see in Florida, and they show up in bananas. Did you know that? They're actually also known as the banana spider. They've been transported into the United States through shipments of fruit. Now, unlike the wandering spider, this is not a nomadic hunter. It's waiting for its prey to come to its web. Now, let's say a fly or a beetle gets trapped in that sticky spider silk. What they will do is rush forward and inflict a bite. That initial hit from those fangs sends the prey into shock, and as the neurotoxic venom is beginning to shut down that victim's system, what the spider will do is crawl back and just watch its prey struggle. The more it struggles, the more it becomes entangled in the web. And once it succumbs to the venom, what they'll do is come in and spin a web around the victim and then store it there. Now, based on the variety of orb weaver, they have a different potency of venom. And one that's here in Central and South America, while I don't believe it can kill you, is extremely painful. A bite from the spider will cause your arm to swell up. It'll be really bad, you'll have dry mouth, cramping in your stomach, and uh, it's gonna be a really, really rough afternoon if I end up getting tagged by this creature. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky, guys. Like the Black Widow, this spider is capable of giving me a pretty painful bite. But to prove to you that this spider is not just out to bite you, what I'm gonna do now is let it walk on my hands and my arm. Are you ready for this? Yeah. You're, you're gonna let that thing walk on you. This is to prove, oh my gosh, I just saw its fangs. Its fangs are huge. <laughs> okay, maybe I'm having second thoughts about this. <sighs> oh boy, here we go. All right, what I wanna do is actually use my spider stick and let the spider get onto the stick first so that it feels a little more comfortable. I'm gonna have to deal with is the webbing, just like I did the Black Widow. Can you see that? And the tensile strength of this web is so much stronger than that of the Black Widow, so I hope that I'm not tangled up too bad. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna start by letting it crawl onto this hand. Oh boy, oh boy. Let me spin it for you like that. Wow, it is beautiful, that's for sure. All right, it seems to be pretty calmed down at this point. And what I'm gonna do is put the stick sideways. Oh, my mouth is getting dry, I'm getting nervous here. I'm gonna just place my hand out in front of the spider and see if it will walk out onto my fingers. Are you ready? One, two, control of it. it's getting back here. Let's see if I can get it out of my hand and around this way. There we go. It's got its legs up in the air. Let me see if I can keep it completely calm there. You can see my hand is shaking a little bit. Is that a defensive position? It's a little bit of a defensive position with the legs up in the air like that. And it's right on my knuckle. Don't bite me, don't bite me, don't bite me. Oh, I can feel all the little hooks of its legs. What are, you, what are you feeling right now? I feel those nerves going? Extremely nervous. I'm trying to just be super still, let the spider find a place where it feels comfortable, and hopefully it will just 
Oh, there we go. Oh, look at that. It wanted to go right back onto the stick. Look, you can actually see the webbing hanging right from the tip of my finger. Here, let me see if I can get it back on my hand. There we go. She's really just interested in getting away. Now remember, the spider does have a neurotoxic venom, very similar to that of the Black Widow. I want to just remain completely calm. You're bitten by the spider, to be clear. It's a very bad situation. It could potentially be really bad, depending how much venom went into my body. Okay, oh man, the webbing is so much stronger than that of the Black Widow. Okay, where did she go? On your elbow, on your elbow, up your back. Okay, it's coming this way. I'm gonna slowly turn, see if I can get her back onto my hand. Yep, yep, there you go, got it. There we go. What I don't want to do is make any sudden movement or pull the webbing too tightly because if she feels threatened, that is when she's going to bite. Now the way that most spider bites end up happening is somebody applies pressure to the arachnid and they fear for their lives. And a bite is oftentimes just a warning that, hey, I am here, don't squish me. Now spiders can control the amount of venom that they inject into what it is they're biting. And because I am not a potential prey item, if she were to bite me, oh boy, right on the tip of my finger there, she's completely tangling me up. If she were to bite me, it could possibly be a dry bite or I would basically keep my fingers crossed and pray that it was not a full on bite loaded with venom because that could be an incredibly bad situation. There we go. She feels real comfortable there. Man, I am getting completely tangled up and I can feel how strong that spider silk is. Coyote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You think you have a good control over the situation here? I don't think you ever have good control when there is a spider just freely climbing around on your what? body. Where does she go? Okay. Wow, I'm getting big time tangled up here, guys. Look at that, there's so much webbing, she's able to just free climb right out on top of me there. That gives me the opportunity to get rid of some of that spider silk. Ooh, just a moment to breathe there where she's not actually on my hand. So tell us why you're doing this, guy. Do you have a reason for this? There's always a reason for this. And the reason is that you should not just automatically be afraid of these spiders. Actually, these arachnids are doing wonderful things for the environment by eating a lot of pest insects. Now, if you're in Central or South America and you see one of these outside of your house, you don't need to be afraid of it. These spiders stick to their webs and all they're doing is catching nuisance insects. Now, if you go into that web and you try to harass the spider, obviously you may be bitten, but the spider really has no interest in actually biting me as long as I don't apply pressure to its body. I'm getting a little more comfortable now, but you always have to keep your guard up because you see how she's getting all tangled up in her own webbing? I don't want her to feel like she's getting pulled in any one direction and then end up inflicting a bite. This is a species that's only interested in eating insects, not in biting humans. Now, you would never do this with something like a wandering spider, correct? No. A wandering spider's venom is so incredibly potent, it could put me in the hospital. A bite from a spider like this, there is the chance that a lot of venom could go into my body. However, as a human, I am not prey for this species. So, the bite probably wouldn't be so bad that I need to go to the hospital. However, it would swell up, it would turn red, I'd have dry mouth, cramping in my stomach, but after about 24 hours, it would be nothing more than a red, itchy spot. You know, my nerves calm quite a bit once the spider has found a spot that it is comfortable and not walking around. You can see its mandibles and fangs are, are well up off of my hand right now, but if I were to startle her or apply any pressure to the top of her body, it would force her down and that's when a bite would be inflicted. Again, I never recommend that you go out in the wild and ever try to free handle a spider on your own. You never know how your body would react to the venom if you were bitten. Well guys, it looks like the sun is starting to get a little low in the sky, which means it's gonna be close to hunting time for this arachnid, because when the sun gets low, that's when all the insects come out. So what I wanna do now, ooh, she's going down my arm, is safely get her back up into her web so that she can go out and hunt for the night. I'm Coyote Peterson. Be brave, stay wild. We'll see you on the next adventure. All right, back up in the web with you. Spiders can be found on almost every continent. And while they are all technically venomous, 
they do their best to save that potent bite for their prey. Unless threatened or provoked, as a human, your odds of being bitten by a spider like the golden orb weaver are slim to none. So if you have the phobia of arachnids running chills down your spine, try to tell yourself that spiders are a good thing. And whether you believe it or not, spiders are actually our friends. Thank you.